Welcome everyone to today's edition of The Parlor. I uh, sincerely hope that you enjoyed that lovely rendition of The Spake Zarathustra. That incredibly melodious... <laughs> dulcet... Oh, turn that shit off. Um... What's the word I'm looking for? You already used it. Euphonious. That wonderfully euphonious rendition of Richard Strauss's Thus Spake Zarathustra. I mean, I've, I've always kind of thought that Strauss misinterpreted Nietzsche to begin with. But when you're dealing with a, shall we say, misinterpretation, a gross misinterpretation of a misinterpretation of a philosopher, that's what you get. And you see, if that's not what you want, then it would be much more conducive for you to do things like tuning into Caleb's stream rather than going into the bottomless pits of hell that are the academy. Instead, you get to hear me snacking on things and Caleb sipping on coffee and us trying to navigate through this sort of a thing, which is somewhat difficult given the fact that he has nothing but a library full of blank books. And I never made it out of preschool, so... Neither of us can actually be counted on to read the material. I'm just pretending you read it. In fact, Thus Spake Zarathustra was never written. I'm just pretending it was written to impress you. I made it up. Hmm. Nietzsche never existed. It's just a projection of my own ego. I'm so pretentious I can make you all hallucinate. So today, we're going to be discussing the bestowing virtue and the night song. So I'm going to put in here the link to the bestowing virtue. And then when we get to the other point, I'll link the night song so that's actually in the relevant portion of the chat. Hmm. It keeps on reminding me to guard my privacy and abide by our community guidelines. So let's not have a repeat of that incident where with the tequila and Matt being an exhibitionist on stream. Exactly. Watch, it's like or origami. No. Anyway, <laughs> let's get started on Friedrich. We're going to do this uh, stream the way we did the last one, 45 minutes, then an intermission for about 20 minutes or so, and then the stream comes back online. Start with chapter 22, The Bestowing Virtue. When Zarathustra had taken leave of the town to which his heart was attached, the name of which is the Pied Cow. There followed him so many people who called themselves his disciples, and kept him company. Thus came they to a crossroad. Then Zarathustra told them that he now wanted to go alone, for he was fond of going alone. His disciples, however, presented him at his departure with a staff, on the golden handle of which a serpent twined round the sun. Zarathustra rejoiced on account of the staff, and supported himself thereon. Then he spoke thus to his disciples. Now before we get into uh, what he's saying there, what I would like to hear from you, Matt, is why a serpent around the sun, knowing uh, that Zarathustra has a serpent and an eagle? A serpent and an eagle and a staff. 
well, there was this one story that you can find in the book of Exodus, <clears throat> wherein uh, God was displeased at the Israelites, as he often was. The Israelites had bitched and moaned about something or another. I believe it was about being thirsty. And uh, God, of course, provided them with water, as he tended to do. But as a punishment for bitching and moaning, uh, God sent serpents amongst them. And uh, many were bitten, some died. And then they went crawling back to Moses saying, we're sorry that we shouldn't have been bitching and moaning. And so Moses prayed to God and God told Moses, cast a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and raise that pole up and anybody who looks at the pole uh, who, be, who, who beholds this serpent on a pole will live from their snake bites. So now we have something even more poignant in a way because A, uh, the golden handle of which there was a serpent twined round the sun. Uh, so we're dealing now with gold rather than bronze, but bronze was of course uh, very valuable back in the day. It was used for casting weapons. You couldn't really make weapons out of gold because gold was no more malleable and so on. And there's this idea without – I'm going to try not to jump too far ahead – that gold is generally useless in every way except for the fact that it's precious, it's rare, and it's shiny. So clearly there's something of value that exists on the tip of something that it literally is there for no other purpose than to be beheld and somehow people have ascertained that in beholding this there is some benefit and where would thou be O great star if thou had not those for whom thou shinest people especially insecure people misinterpret that as Nietzsche saying that the little ones all exist for the benefit of the great men like Nietzsche but what he's saying is exactly the opposite the great men like Nietzsche exist only for the benefit of the masses Exactly. If for no other reason than to kind of serve as a means of directing one's attention away from the mundane and onto the profound. Away from, I mean, of course, it's, it's important where your next meal is going to come from, and it's important where your next drink is going to come from. And when you're in a desert, yeah, that's kind of an issue of concern. If, however, there exists one or there exists some set of principles or there exists something that you can trust in to be the source of all good for you and then you're constantly doubting it, well, sometimes you might need to get your ass kicked. Right. And so Nietzsche is basically uh, in an allegorical way here saying, hey, maybe I have something, maybe I can point you towards something that you can hang your hat on, towards something that might help keep you oriented in the right direction so that you can wind up having all these things that you need as a mere consequence of the better thing. In fact, this goes very closely along with Nietzsche's understanding of love. Tell me, pray, how came gold to the highest value? because it is uncommon 
and unprofiting, and beaming and soft in luster, it always bestoweth itself. It bestows itself. Gold is uncommon, it is rare. Unprofiting, that's important. It has no value outside of its rarity and its beauty. And beaming, it's beautiful. And soft and luster, again, beautiful. It always bestoweth itself. The one thing gold gives you is gold. And that's enough. Because it's gold. <laughs> gold yes, is gold. bronze. Bronze gives you weapons. Silver gives you antibacterial properties and the ability to be cast into something more useful. Gold is too soft to be useful. It means literally nothing other than a shiny metal. The only use for which we can possibly imagine is to be beheld. Only as image of the highest virtue came gold to the highest value. Now, the highest virtue among a human being is someone who is or who creates beautiful things. Beautiful in terms of art or philosophy or theory or whatever. And those kinds of people are rare, and they don't do much besides being and creating beauty. And the reason gold is a currency and the standard of exchange in a lot of ways, even if your currency is not backed by gold, the, the United States government, even though our currency is not backed by gold, still uh, makes it its business to own a lot of gold. Gee, I wonder why. And the reason for that is that gold, why, why do humans value gold in that way? And that's because in a metaphysical sense, gold is a reflection of the same thing that makes certain people valuable. Only as image of the highest virtue came gold to the highest value. Gold-like beameth the glance of the bestower. Gold luster maketh peace between moon and sun. The moon being something cold, contemplative, uh, related to the conscience, related to spirit in the way Nietzsche uses that word, and sun being less spirit and more blood, more passion, more radiance, chaos. One must still have chaos in oneself to give birth to a dancing star or sun. And gold luster, that basically beauty, aesthetics, brings peace between moon and sun, reconciles them. Uncommon is the highest virtue, and unprofiting. Beaming is it, and soft of luster. A bestowing virtue is the highest virtue. Verily, I divine you as well, my disciples. Ye strive like me for the bestowing virtue. What should ye have in common with cats and wolves? Wolves are predator, cats are scavengers and predators. And they're wolves, both pack animals. Wolves are scavengers as well. Yes. It is your thirst to become sacrifices and gifts yourselves. And therefore have ye the thirst to accumulate all riches in your soul, gathering riches to make yourself a sacrifice or to, you know, create your dancing star. Insatiably striveth your soul for treasures and jewels because your virtue is insatiable in desiring to bestow, because you have to have before you give, you have to be rich before you can endow. Ye constrain all things to flow towards you and into you, so that they shall flow back again out of your fountain as the gifts of your love. There is this idea of virtue, not just in ancient European thought, but all around the world, this idea of virtue as having an attractive or uh, aligning power. Confucius, for example, speaks of the North Star as a paradigm of virtue because everything else goes around it. So, and <clears throat> a considerably later, uh, 
Luther speaks of the definition of a god. And he, of course, talks about God both in the abstract and in the concrete. The first commandment of the Christian faith is, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, but Luther in his explanation says, uh, what does it mean to have a god or what is a god? And in answer he says, a god means that from which we are to expect all good and in which we are to take refuge in all distress. So to have a god is nothing other than trusting and believing him with a heart. Uh, I have often said that the confidence and faith of the heart alone make both God and an idol. So whatever you set your heart on and put your trust in is truly your God. So if bestowing something is a virtue, then bestowers are either agents of God in a way or gods themselves. Not contradictory, those two. No, not at all, but I'm going to say or. Not, necess not necessarily either or, but or. Or inclusive. Mm -hmm. Mother asks her, log her logician doctor, is it a boy or girl? Logician doctor says yes. yes. So Nietzsche would definitely be in, in you know, it's in seeing Zarathustra talking about striving to become and so on, the Ubermesh would be essentially saying, okay, whatever you do, amass as much to yourself as possible so that you can give lavishly. And this bestowing virtue, that is charity, that is love. Verily, an appropriator of all values must such bestowing love become. But healthy and holy call I this selfishness. Because if you think you can create this stuff, then it is, if you think you can create beauty, it is totally, it is completely acceptable for you to regard the, your job in life to be gathering things so you can make this stuff. And that will appear at least selfish to other people. Another selfishness is there. An all too poor and hungry kind, which would always steal. The selfishness of the sick, the sickly selfishness. With the eye of the thief it looketh upon all that is lustrous. With the cravings of hunger it measureth him who hath abundance. And ever doth it prowl round the tables of bestowers. Sickness speaketh in such craving, and invisible degeneration. Of a sickly body speaketh the larcenous craving of this selfishness. So what does that mean? Well, keep in mind that perhaps a selfish person could kid themselves. Uh, into thinking that they're taking on the bestowing virtue. So, you know, some cheap ass basically could use this as an excuse to just take stuff and never do anything productive. But they're not really doing it. Tell me, well, my brother. What's the difference in between being a, a moocher and a producer? And and the truth is to produce, everyone hates me take, moochers. Yeah. Consume. Yes, everyone hates moochers. Because they lead to... Well, here it says, tell me, my brother, what do we think bad and worst of all? Is it not degeneration? And we always suspect degeneration when the bestowing soul is lacking. Ah. Sickness. Oh, no. Tell me, my brother, what do we think bad and worst of all? Is it not degeneration? And we always suspect degeneration when the bestowing soul is lacking. 
so you know the first way you could tell perhaps that a tree is diseased if it is, is is if it stops making fruit apple tree didn't make any apples this year what's wrong with it it's degenerating stopped producing something's out of order in there upward goeth our course from genera on to super genera but a horror to us is the degenerating sense which saith all for myself upward soareth our sense thus is it a simile of our body a simile of an elevation such similes of elevations are the names of the virtues thus goeth the body through history a becomer and fighter and the spirit what is it to the body its fights and victories herald its companion and echo similes are all names of good and evil they do not speak out they only hint a fool who seeketh knowledge from them give heed my brethren to every hour when your spirit would speak in similes there is the origin of your virtue Elevated is then your body, and raised up. With its delight enraptureth it the spirit, so that it become creator and valuer and lover and everything's benefactor. I want to backtrack here a bit. Give heed, my brethren, to every hour when your spirit would speak in similes. There is the origin of your virtue. So those times when it seems like you're making analogies, there's the origin of your virtue because you're synthesizing, you're producing when you're speaking in similes, when you feel moved to start connecting things, because you're making. And oftentimes the big abstract things can't be communicated except for with reference to the more concrete things. So when, you th when you're thinking about drawing on something really deep, and you can't help but articulate it in some way, you're going to be forced to depend upon literary devices such as simile or metaphor, or you could just have the desire to speak in them, or you would like to be able to convey it, but it might just be too much. At some point, it might just be too much. Sometimes you just have to go and do whatever it is you're going to, whatever it is you're going to do, and, and, um, realize it's coming from a place of bestowing something upon someone or something. When your heart overfloweth broad and is and full like a river, a blessing and a danger to the lowlanders, there is the origin of your virtue. Because again, love for Nietzsche is a bestowing. <clears throat> When ye are exalted above praise and blame, and your will would command all things as a loving one's will, there is the origin of your virtue. Basically, when you can say to yourself, I wish everything were just like this, there's the origin of your virtue. When ye despise pleasant things and the effeminate couch, and cannot couch far enough from the effeminate, there is the origin of your virtue. When ye are willers of one will, and when that change of every need is needful to you, there is the origin of your virtue. When, it, when you feel the desire to be unified and sort of allow uh, no longer be a fractured will but be organized around a central theme, that's the origin of the virtue because the part of you that's willing that is the strongest virtue in you. Power is it, this new virtue. A ruling thought is it, and around it a subtle soul. A golden sun with the serpent of knowledge around it. Here paused Zarathustra a while, and looked lovingly on his disciples. Then he continued to speak thus, and his voice had changed. Remain true to the earth, my brethren, with the power of your virtue. Let your bestowing love and your knowledge be devoted to the meaning of the earth. Thus do I pray and conjure you. 
Let it not fly away from the earthly and beat against eternal walls with its wings. Ah, there hath always been so much flown away virtue. Because Nietzsche sees this idle contemplation of things beyond experience as a waste of time, mostly because he misunderstands Kant, but, uh, or perhaps takes Kant a bit too seriously, but we'll have to save that for a different time. Led, like me, the flown away virtue back to the earth. Oh, lead, like me, the flown away virtue back to the earth. Yea, back to body and life. That it may give to the earth its meaning, a human meaning. A hundred times hitherto hath spirit as well as virtue flown away and blundered. Alas, in our body dwelleth still all this delusion and blundering, body and will hath it there become. A hundred times hitherto hath spirit as well as virtue attempted and erred. Yea, an attempt hath man been. Alas, too much ignorance and error hath become embodied in us. Not only the rationality of millenniums, also their madness breaketh out in us. Dangerous is it to be in error. Still fight we step by step with the giant chance, and over all mankind hath hitherto ruled nonsense, the lack of sense. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing, even from Nietzsche's perspective. Uh, like I said earlier, one must still have chaos in oneself to have give birth to a dancing star. Let and your you spirit can be fighting, and you can be fighting against it, as 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 we're clearly seeing here. I mean, obviously, if you have some sort of a goal, and you're already there, well, then what in the world is the oh, uh, where is the meaning in that? Let your spirit and your virtue be devoted to the sense of the earth, my brethren. Let the value of everything be determined anew by you. Therefore shall ye be fighters, therefore shall ye be creators. Now what Nietzsche means there, um, spirit, remember for him, is the conscience and is connected with the abstract intellect. Um, and virtue, again, is sort of the telos of the individual human being. So it, he says that organize the telos and conscience and intellect all toward giving meaning to immediate experience, to imminence, and create new virtues by going into pure imminence. In other words, things flow. In other words, things are flowing from the direction of the abstract into the imminent. Right. In terms of, in terms of, of course, being creative, or engaging the bestowing virtue. Intelligently doth the body purify itself, attempting with intelligence it exalteth it, exalteth itself. To the discerners all impulses sanctify themselves. To the exalted the soul becomes joyful. So all impulses sanctify themselves to the discerners. That an impulse is sanctified by virtue of the meaning it gives to the earth because the meaning it gives to the earth is something that validates that impulse. Um, another issue here is... Uh, that intelligence for Nietzsche is a kind of tool, like Matt said, flowing from the direction of the abstract into the Im imminent. Uh, sort of the intellect as a means of realizing the individual telos, the primary tool and or weapon in the hand of a human being or an ubermensch. Physician, heal thyself, then wilt thou also heal thy patient. Let it be his best cure. To see with his eyes him who maketh himself whole. So, you know, fix yourself first, basically. And then when you fix someone else, you fix them by letting them see you. you it's a lead by example type thing. But there's more to it than lead by example. It's due to yourself the transformation you want to see in other people. It's like Gandhi. You must become the change you wish to see in the world. Because ultimately, an externally imposed change upon somebody else isn't going to be isn't going to be permanent. I mean, I suppose you can do brainwashing and things of that nature, re-education, all these other different things that have been tried. But until a person goes and decides himself that something's going to be a particular way, 
all you're doing is putting a band-aid over a gaping wound if you if there's something you want badly enough you need to be willing to change in order to get it even if that is wanting somebody else to be able to be more self-actualized as it seems that Nietzsche does right like what in the world is he trying to do here except to encourage people to develop themselves to produce to attempt to make meaning I mean without doing that if there isn't something else binding it all together what is there we devolve to the baser instincts and lose that which makes us human A thousand paths are there which have never yet been trodden. A thousand celebrities in hidden islands of life. Unexhausted and undiscovered is still man and man's world. Awake and hearken, ye lonesome ones. From the future come winds with stealthy pinions, and to fine ears good tidings are proclaimed. Ye lonesome ones of today, ye seceding ones, ye shall one day be a people. Out of you who have chosen yourselves shall a chosen people arise, and out of it the superman. Verily a place of healing shall the earth become, and already is a new odor diffused around it, a salvation bringing odor, and a new hope. So what Nietzsche is saying is that basically he wants to reach the people who can see what he sees if he explains it, and get them to choose the best from themselves to try to make the Superman, because that's the only way out of this he sees. Remember, for Nietzsche, in order for humankind to continue... They ha we have to reach a qualitatively different kind of human. Now, I have my disagreements with Nietzsche there, and I think there's a contradiction in his philosophy there because he insists on pure imminence. But, uh, in the context of what he's saying is that the only way for us to have that qualitative improvement that humankind will need to survive, we're gonna have to take the cream of the crop and have them focus solely on achieving that. When Zarathustra had spoken these words, he paused like one who had not said his last word, and long did he balance the staff doubtfully in his hand. At last he spoke, and his voice had changed. I now go alone, my disciples. Ye also now go away and alone, so will I have it. Remember, he says flee from the marketplace into your solitude, but he also says, um... He also uses that, those three metamorphoses that the load-bearing spirit, the camel, can bring all of these heavy loads into its interior wilderness and there be transformed. And that's why he tells everyone to go alone. He wants people to retreat into solitude because he thinks that in, part of what it will mean for humans to become qualitatively better will mean for people to be more self-sufficient as individuals paradoxically, or not paradoxically, but perhaps uh, counterintuitively, to create a better society. You'll need people who aren't such drones, basically. In other words, the society functions more, or th this is not his point, but it's kind of predicated upon the idea that we're not all cogs in some machine but we are individual individuals with agency so we can't use the image of a machine cranking 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 in order to describe the world we would 
we should rather view it as the complex organism or ecosystem that it actually happens to be. You can't go and and reduce people to the level that, well, dare, dare I say, people have been reduced, especially over the course of the 20th century. There is a lot more. Now, I would say, in making his case, Nietzsche has thrown out the baby with the bathwater, but there was an awful lot of bathwater that needed to be purged as a consequence of Enlightenment philosophy. Right. And he actually, he hits on that in this next section. When Zarathustra had spoken these words, he paused, like one who had not said his last word. And long did he balance the staff doubtfully in his hand. At last he spoke thus, and his voice had changed. I now go alone, my disciples. Ye also now go away and be alone. So will I have it. Verily I advise you, depart from me, and guard yourselves against Zarathustra. And better still, be ashamed of him. Perhaps he hath deceived you. Well, what he's saying is he's, uh, is he's literally looking his reader dead in the eye and saying, don't take my word for it, I might just be full of shit. Which you have to admire, especially from somebody as pompous as Nietzsche is. Uh, that That is a... That's some integrity there. Like, well, I, how do you know I'm not full of shit? Think about it. Come on, use your head. Uh... And and that's that is yeah I I like that a lot. You wouldn't really expect any anything else from him though, given what you know about him. Of course not. Knowing what kind of a dude he was, knowing what he wrote, yeah he he doesn't, and especially knowing what he wants, he doesn't want you to take what he says as gospel, even though it's written literally to sound like the gospels. Uh, <laughs> he he wants you to think about it. The man of knowledge must be able not only to love his enemies, but also to hate his friends. One requiteth a teacher badly if one remain merely a scholar. And why will ye not pluck at my wreath? Like he has a laurel wreath on his head and he wants you to pluck at it, kind of take stuff off of it. And this idea of hating one's friends doesn't necessarily mean hating in the same way that we might understand hating. It's just, it's, it's more a rhetorical device. I mean... Love your enemies, okay, that's just one thing. Hate your friends, that's just the, the antipathy to the love your enemies thing. But ultimately, if you have a friend, if there's somebody that you actually care about, are you willing to risk your friendship in order to tell your friend the truth? If you're not, well, then you are a really bad friend. If you care about somebody, and let's say I have a friend who's 400 pounds and who is uh, enabling himself to be sick, diabetic, fat, uh, who's uh, eating three gallons of ice cream a night and uh, claims that anybody who says that being as overweight as he is is bad as fat shaming. If I don't want to see, if I don't want to be attending his funeral in five years, I'm ultimately going to have to put my foot down and say, hey, look, I'm not fat shaming. Or maybe I am. But whatever it is that I'm doing here, it's for your own good. Dude, lay off on the ice cream, lay off, uh, lay off the Doritos. And the cigarettes. Eat. And, and the cigarettes, eat, eat a freaking salad and go on a walk. Uh, you all can't see my video, but I'm surrounded by smoke right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't have your video open either. Yeah, Caleb, lay off of the cigarettes. It will be much more difficult for you to find a mate if... You smell like an ashtray, yes. Ye venerate me. But what if your veneration should someday collapse? Take heed lest a statue crush you. So if you put all your eggs in one basket, and that basket's called Zarathustra or Friedrich Nietzsche, 
and that comes crashing down, what are you going to do? You got crushed by the falling statue. You say you believe in Zarathustra, but of what account is Zarathustra? You are my believers, but of what account are all believers? Ye had not sought, sought yourselves, then did you find me. So do all believers. Therefore all belief is of so little account. Now do I bid you lose me and find yourselves, and only when ye have all denied me will I return unto you. So what he's saying there is, that bit about the physician healing himself, that's what Zarathustra's doing. Zarathustra lost everybody else and found himself, and now he's telling you to do that, and he's hoping that you'll, since you found him and saw what that looks like, you'll be able to do it. It's hands-on learning. hands-on learning on an individual basis which ultimately means hands-off learning as in the teacher doesn't have his hands meddling up and mucking up something that needs to occur on a personal level so don't listen to Caleb don't listen to me come to your own conclusions on the matter or we'll be here listen to us and then decide we're full of shit and see if that's actually true And, you know, we're, we are fallible. I mean, this whole, this whole idea about being full of crap, it's not just, it, it's not just a rhetorical device. There, is, there, there, there are many things that I know that I'm not perfect in, many things I know I'm wrong about. And I'm certainly not agreeing with Nietzsche on every, on every, on every point that he brings up. Quite far from it, but... I found some pearls. I think they're worth sharing. And maybe the pearls you find will be slightly different depending upon your position in life. And the pearls Caleb has found will be different in the, depending upon his position in life and so on. And we can obviously come back and revisit this stuff. But ultimately, you have agency. You have the ability to go and assess the situation and act accordingly. You don't need anyone else to do your thinking for you. Sure, you can consult, but don't shut your brain off and be a mindless zombie follower thing. And once again shall ye have become friends unto me, and children of one hope. Then will I be with you for the third time, to celebrate the great noontide with you. And it is the great noontide, when man is in the middle of his course between animal and superman, and celebrateth his advance to the evening as his highest hope, for it is the advance to a new morning. At such time will the downgoer bless himself, that he should be an overgoer, and the sun of his knowledge will be at noontide. Dead are all the gods, now do we desire the Superman to live. Let this be our final will at the great noontide. Thus spoke Zarathustra. Well, that's all we have for now for this part of the stream. We're going to shut down, but we're going to be back soon. Uh, we're going to take a little 20-minute intermission and start streaming again. Uh, before we get go i would really appreciate it if everyone present would please hit the like button uh please click that like button because when you click the like button it promotes the videos and makes me easier to find and uh so i'm going to shut the stream down now and we'll be back in about 20 minutes or so and we'll stream for another hour on the chapter the night song Thank you all for showing up. We'll be back soon.